This comes as no surprise to anyone, but I didn't grow up with all of the Studio Ghibli films. When I was in elementary school, the only films I really knew existed at the time, albeit very vaguely, was My Neighbor Totoro, Spirited Away, and Howl's Moving Castle. And back then, I didn't even know what Studio Ghibli was because I was too young to comprehend shit like that. But just like most kids my age during this time frame, I watched a lot of television. One channel that I watched a lot was the Disney Channel. I mean, come on, who hasn't watched Disney Channel, Cartoon Network, or Nickelodeon at one point in their childhood? Those are huge staples. And with that, I watched really just a bunch of Disney Channel originals and Disney Channel films that were made only for the channel and was not really exposed to any form of media outside of that. But one day, eight-year-old me was sitting on the couch watching some good old-fashioned Disney Channel original show. I don't know. Let's just say Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. I think that was on during that time. When all of a sudden, I saw a trailer for a film that I don't recall seeing anything like it before. All I remember about that moment now was just, I saw a fish turn into a girl. That's it. It wouldn't be until years later where not only would I actually watch the film, I would look more into that film and discover how much marketing Disney did to promote it, and how it was a very huge hit internationally here for Studio Ghibli compared to past films. We're diving in here on the latest edition of the Studio Ghibli Project, Episode 17, Ponyo on the Cliff by the Sea, also known as Ponyo. The movie follows a five-year-old boy named Sosuke who lives on an oceanside cliff with his mother Lisa. One day, he finds a goldfish trapped in a bottle on the beach and upon rescuing her, names her Ponyo. But it turns out that she is no ordinary goldfish. She is actually the daughter of a masterful wizard and a sea goddess. After a little bit, Ponyo quickly falls in love with Sosuke and uses her father's magic to transform herself into a young girl, but the use of such powerful sorcery causes a dangerous imbalance in the world. As the days go by and Ponyo's father literally sends the ocean's waves to find his daughter, Sosuke and Ponyo embark on an adventure of a lifetime to save the world and fulfill Ponyo's dreams of becoming human. Production for Ponyo began in May of 2006, with the key animation beginning five months later in October. It was publicly announced on March 19th, 2007 that Ghibli will be working on their next Miyazaki project, and a screen capture was revealed to the public the next day of what we now know as Ponyo in a Pail of Water. This is something I wanted to highlight when it comes to this film because this is where Miyazaki's beliefs are shown in a big way as none of this film is computer generated. All of it is hand drawn. The decision was made after it was discovered the computer graphics section at Ghibli was shut down before production began, leaving the studio to go old school. Even though Miyazaki was the creator of Ponyo, not that many people know that Miyazaki started his journey through the industry as an animator, so he took advantage of this opportunity and was heavily involved in the animation process and constantly challenged himself by experimenting with the most important scenes in the film. When the animation was done, the studio created 170,000 different images that would turn into an hour and 41 minute film, a record for a Miyazaki film. The movie came out in Japan on July 19th, 2008, but many of you guys are familiar with the English release over a year later on August 14th, 2009, which made $1.2 million on opening night, $3.5 million in its first weekend in North America, and a total of over $15 million in 927 theaters out of the over $200 million US dollar worldwide box office gross this movie obtained. To put that into perspective, Princess Mononoke opened in North America in 38 theaters in 1999, making just over 24,000, spirited away in 26 theaters in 2002, making over 125,000, a way better ratio that would lead to the movie getting an Oscar, and Howl's Moving Castle in 36 theaters in 2005, making just over 129,000. Compared to Miyazaki's previous films, Walt Disney Pictures, the distributors for the English dub for the film, heavily marketed this movie with frequent appearances of the film's trailers, a couple of very rare appearances by Miyazaki himself both at San Diego Comic Con 2009 and at a seminar at UC Berkeley, by showing off the borderline A-list cast of Tina Fey, Matt Damon, Kate Blanchett, Liam Neeson, Lily Tomlin, Cloris Leachman, and Betty fucking White, and the number of interviews given to the English voices of Sosuke and Ponyo, 8-year-old Frankie Jonas, and 9-year-old Noah Cyrus, two Disney Channel stars at the time who are related to even bigger Disney Channel stars in The Jonas Brothers and Miley Cyrus. They even sang the English version of the theme song together. 
You know, when I was looking stuff up for this, I never thought I would see the day when I discovered Ponyo dated little Zan at one point. Alright, after this point, there's going to be a couple of spoilers regarding the movie, so for anyone who has not seen Ponyo yet, I suggest you do before watching this video if, if you want to. If you don't, then you're just going to have to embrace the spoilers because I, I can't really find a timestamp. This is just the rest of the video, so if you want to be spoiled just a tiny bit, that's your call. Alright, you've been warned. It's pretty evident Miyazaki was intending for a younger demographic when making this film, and it shows through how he portrayed some of the characters. With that, brings up some funny moments, like when Sosuke's parents talk to each other through Morse code because Sosuke's father is a sailor. But for better or for worse, the characters were the highlight of the film. Sosuke seemed way too smart for a five-year-old boy, and his mother Lisa just comes off as unrealistic, which is a total shock in your system if you look back at how Miyazaki wrote female characters like San and Sophie and Chihiro. But for some reason, when it comes to writing human adult females, unlike the usual female heroines that he writes all the time, there was just something off with her. As for everyone else, they were all fine, even though the film just stuck to its childlike essence. The rest of the adults are a little too lively, considering the fact that their village ended up getting flooded, and Ponyo, well, if you don't like Ponyo the character, you have no soul. If you don't like Ponyo the character, you deserve to be sent down to the depths of hell, strapped into a chair with your eyes forced open a la A Clockwork Orange, and you're gonna watch this movie enough times until you accept that that Ponyo is the best character. As I mentioned before, the animation was absolutely stunning. There was something exclusive this film had, and it was how there was always movement, something Miyazaki always wanted to experiment with, which played a huge part thanks to the film being entirely hand-drawn. It's especially exclusive in this time period, in like the late 2000s compared to the 90s, because when I'm watching this, I'm being reminded of Studio Ghibli's older work works because they were also hand-drawn and they also had a lot of movement. It's the first time that this new generation has been introduced to a new Studio Ghibli film that has a lot of things going on at the same time that CG never really accomplished. How the environment and the weather was drawn up, you could tell this was peak Ghibli quality and adds to the visual appeal to that younger demographic that this film successfully goes to in this case. Considering this film features a lot of underwater wildlife, Miyazaki once again implements an environmental message into this film. He's done this multiple times before. Princess Mononoke, Nausicaa, I have to go far back as that, Spirited Away, Howl's Moving Castle, basically in almost every film you can argue that. But what makes it unique here compared to his past attempts was at first it morphed very well into the film. But when you found out that the film has a prophetic scenario where the world can only be saved by an analogy that humans should protect nature, the tone changes rather quickly. It fits very well into the film, but as it keeps going on, it turns into a completely different film that quickly. It's basically if Nausicaa, the Valley of the Wind, and My Neighbor Totoro had a kid. Totoro being the first half and Nausicaa being the second half of this movie. Once again, the legend at the helm of the soundtrack, Joe Hisaishi, nailing it again with his amazing orchestral pieces. He's been doing this for so long, even his daughter helped out on the vocals for a few tracks. Like I said earlier in the video, the dub cast had some major names, and for the most part, I liked them. Apart from Jonas and Cyrus, I thought the dub cast fit really well in with their roles. Again, borderline A-list cast. I assume they only got in this position because they're related to famous people because Cyrus and Jonas were barely in anything before 2009. But hey, if Miyazaki likes the dub, I can't go wrong with that. As for the Japanese dub, this also continued the trend of A-list actors and comedians appearing in Miyazaki's films. But the one voice actress that made an appearance, or should I say made her return on a Miyazaki film, was Rumi Hidagi, who played Lisa, Sosuke's mom, seven years after she played Chihiro in Spirited Away. She would end up appearing in another Studio Ghibli film after this and from up on Poppy Hill, but in this case, I thought it was a pretty cool reunion nonetheless. While some things are different about Ponyo compared to almost everything else Miyazaki has come out with up until this point, personally... That lasting effect that you get when you finish a Miyazaki film, it's still there. If not, in some cases during the film, it got more, it got bigger, it got more impactful. When I saw the scene where Ponyo was running on the waves during the flood, that was, in my mind, an amazing example 
of how far someone's imagination can go. And it's easily understandable why not only kids my age, but kids now would want to see it. Uh, I've seen people older than me say that Ponyo is their favorite film, and I can see that. There is something in this film that everyone would latch on to. Just because it's a kid's film doesn't mean it's only for kids. And with that, I'm giving Ponyo a 9 out of 10. Thank you guys for watching the latest edition of the Studio Ghibli Project. If you like this video, hit the like button down below. If you want to see more videos like this in the near future, you can hit the subscribe button either on the screen or down below right next to my channel. Also, if you want to see any videos that I've made in the past, there are videos on the screen as well as down in my channel below. And with that, my name is Payne, and we'll see you in the next video.